Welcome, welcome, welcome. Coming to the room, all those that are able to jump on the live today, this evening. It is 7.04. I know I was scheduled at 7 p.m., but I was really seeking the Lord and in prayer. Um, And so here we are, and we are just excited uh, for what God is going to do today, how he's going to speak, how he's going to move, completely um, yielding ourselves to Holy Spirit for him to have his way. Amen. And so um, come into the room. I'll give it a few minutes before we get started. Um, but yeah, I am. Um, yeah, it's a good day. Um, it didn't start off that way necessarily. Um, didn't have a great day yesterday, but you know, um, every day is a good day in the Lord, right? Because we woke up, we have breath in our bodies, we're alive. But um, we will have days, you know, where it's sometimes it's just heavy. Sometimes, you know, it's the, the pressure and the, and the weight and, and the, you know, and the frustrations or, you know, just all the spiritual, sometimes not nothing physical that you can see or that you can identify, but you might just sense a heaviness in the spirit. Or sometimes you're just tired. Sometimes, you know, you've been fighting, you've been waiting. Sometimes, you know, you've just been kind of dealing with thing after thing and you just get weary and tired. We will have those days, right? The Bible never promises that we will never have days where we're tired, where we're um, spiritually lethargic, you know, where, you know, we are weary. Um, but, you know, we find our strength in the Lord, right? The Bible tells us that in our weakness, um, he is made strong. So it's not in our own power that we are relying on or leaning or should not be or nor should it be our own understanding for the Bible tell us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths. That is Proverbs 3 and 5, 5 and 6. And so as we are journeying, you know, we have to be mindful that the scriptures are literal. You know, there are some times where there is a lot of symbolism um, and wording um, that is used, a descriptive wording, po- poetic wording that may not be so literal, but the scriptures are literal. So when it tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart, that means with every fiber of our being, like our entire heart, we are to trust him. So there shouldn't be an area of our heart that we are holding back from him that we are afraid or we just don't want to release it because you know when it's something about fully releasing that you know you know in that moment that I don't have no control and that is what God is desiring and I'm speaking to myself because I know even for me that there are still some areas that I have not fully surrendered and submitted unto the Lord and so that sometimes can bring unnecessary frustration and unnecessary, you know, um, battles and obstacles because at the end, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. So when you begin to hold parts of your heart back where you're not trusting God and you're still trusting in you, now you're leaning to your own understanding. Now you're trying to figure it out. I mean, again, I'm talking about myself, right? Um, now I'm trying to figure it out. Now I'm trying to, you know, look at the situation and see what can I do? How can I put my hands to something? How can I make the situation turn out the way that I desire? Because another thing about trusting in the Lord with all your heart, so completely surrender, surrendering and submitting to him. Now you really don't know how it's going to happen, right? You really have surrendered the how, right? All, you're, all you are required to do is do follow the instructions, right? You do what's required. So whatever God tell you to do, that's what you do. Even if he say, be still. And for me, that's the hardest, right? Trusting him fully is one thing. Um, surrendering is a whole nother, but be still. Oh no, be still is something that really, really, really has been a challenge for me because I'm a doer by nature and I always feel like I need to be doing something. Hey, Miss Lily, I always feel like I need to be doing something. And so when the Bible says be still and know or stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, there is something about that that lets you know in that moment if you have an issue where you cannot stand still and just trust God to work it out. When you can't just stand still and trust that God has your back, when you can't just stand still and know that God is going to take care of your enemies where you feel like you still have to do something that lets you know you don't trust God with all your heart 
right? Going back to Proverbs 3 and 5, trusting the Lord with all your heart, me, it, Lord, even if you tell me to do nothing, even though if everything is coming at me at once, even though the walls are closing in on me, even though, you know, I got bill collectors and they're, they're threatening to come do this or that. And, you know, this is about to get cut off or that, or I'm going through this situation. Or I got this report at the doctor's office, whatever the case may be. Sometimes the instruction you're given is be still. And so, again, that's one that I've been really wrestling with myself. I don't know about you, Miss Lily, or anybody else that'll jump on the live or hear the replay. But I know for me, you know, it's just that, that again, that's another level of that pride that needs to be uprooted. Because in, in the moment where you just feel like you got to do something, when you just can't let God, let go and let God, that's pride. Because there's something in you that's telling you that you can do it better than God, right? Telling you that you're able to work it out better than him right or that you just trust yourself more than you trust God and that is where we're constantly going to be in this cycle of you know frustration and you know being disappointed because we're trying to be God where God needs to be God right and so we're going to get started with today's episode. Um, so I'm so excited for uh, what I believe the Lord has spoken to me. Today's episode is called Watchers on the Wall. Um, so we are in season five and our season, our fifth season is titled Queens in the Promised Land. And it's all about how do we reign and rule and govern as we're in our promise, when we're in the promise, we're no longer waiting on it, where we're in it, right? When you're in the land of answered prayers, where you're like, where you're like Hannah, and you can say, I've prayed for this. Amen. You can say, I prayed for this and the Lord granted me what I've asked of him. When you're no longer tarrying, when you're no longer warring, when you're no longer faith in, when you are actually living out that promise, right? How do you still reign and rule? How do you remain humble? How do you continue to stay, keep God at the forefront? How do you continue to glorify God? How do you continue to do all of the things that you were doing in your season of waiting or in your wilderness? Because there's something about the wilderness and the waiting season that pushes so close to God that we don't have a choice but to be obedient. We don't have to, a choice but to humble ourselves. We don't have a choice but to, to acknowledge him in all our ways. We don't have a choice but to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these other things shall be established. But it's a whole other thing when you're now in that place and you're not you're not in need anymore, right? Not in, in a physical need, amen? We're always in need, right? Because God is our source. He is our, we, our, we live and move and have our being in God. So he is always our need. We always are in need, no matter where we are, no matter how high we go, no matter how much stuff we acquire, no matter how much money we have, it does not matter. We always are in need because without Christ, we are nothing. We can do nothing. But it's something about when you're no longer in that place of lack, when you're in abundance. It's something about when you're not waiting for that marriage and that husband that you got it, right? It's something about when you're no longer praying for that child where your womb has become fruitful. It's something about when you're no longer praying about your business going from the being um, in the red, but now you're in the black and you're prospered, it's prospering and you're profiting and you're successful. It is something about when you're now, he, you're no longer a youth minister. Or you're no, no longer only got two or three people who may come to your Bible studies or come to your prayer meeting, but now you're over a multitude. There's something about when you've got that promotion that you have been t waiting for and you've been praying and fasting for. It's something about when you enter to the land of promise and see, this is why Israel had to continue, you continually be processed. And God repeatedly said the same thing to them over and over and over through Moses. Be careful to follow the commands that I'm giving you today. If you follow all the commands that I'm giving you this day, if you follow all the commands I'll give you this day, then you that's in the land that I am giving you. Now, Lily, let me know if I, you can still hear me because um, something just kind of uh, went off and I want to make sure it's not messing with my volume. Okay, perfect. And so, um, it is something, you know, about when the Israelites were preparing to go into the promise, right? They had to continually be admonished. Do not forget the Lord thy God. Do not forget because, you know, I, it's again, I spoke about this on last episode. We tend to judge people quickly when we see people who have been in, placed in positions of pro power or in leadership, especially in the church. And then we see, you know, maybe they kind of go astray. We see that they may fall into sin. We see that they may, you know, have some kind of scandal be exposed. Right. We see that they, you know, may start looking like the world and we're quick to judge and we're quick to say, oh, I can't believe that person 
or that person must really wasn't saved. But see, it's easy for you to talk about a situation that you ain't never been in because you don't know the pressure and, and the temptation that come with being in a place that you ain't never been. You don't know what it's like to be in a place and you got a lot of pressure on you because you're leading this people, you're leading this church and you're trying to do the right thing. But then you got all these other things coming at you. The enemy come harder at you, the higher you go. So you don't know the as, as a man, how many women is probably throwing they self at him when he really do want to be faithful to his wife, right? You don't know, right? You don't know, you know, the man of God who really want to do things the right way, but his church, the finances just ain't there. And he want to write on God and then hear this opportunity come and, and it's what he need. And he think he's doing the right thing for his church. You don't know that pressure. So it's so easy to say that, oh, I can't believe that person did that. And I can't believe, oh, they must not have been saved. But no, a lot of people start off well. A lot of people start off righteous. And it is the pressure. It is the influence, right? And that's why God do so much processing before the promised land. That is why. That is why he teach you to depend on him. That's why he 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 will have to give you manna every day if that's what it call that's what it calls for. That's why he will have to literally get bring water out of the rock for you. That is why he'll have to really shape and mold you and get Egypt out of you. You can't hear. Can you hear now? Can you hear me, Lily? Okay. And so this is why God will have to show himself as El Shaddai, God Almighty to you. This is why he'll have to show himself as Yahweh Yaira, as as the provider. This is why you might have to go through a sickness and he might have to show himself as healer. This is why. This is why he has to do these things. This is why he has to go before you and he has to defeat your enemy so you know that it wasn't you. This is why he wants to build you up to a place where you're so anchored in him that you won't succumb to the pressure and the temptation because in the same way that satan tempted jesus that is in the same way the enemy is going to tempt us when we begin to elevate so it's so important that we stay rooted in god and stay close to god and constantly are humbling ourselves and constantly taking inventory of ourselves working out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling and if you know that you're getting you know you're you're kind of going astray if you know you're you know you're not as close or you're kind of you know falling away a little bit that it is up to you to try to get yourself back into alignment to get back on that path of righteousness because it's so easy we don't think it is because you know people love God you know you love God but I tell you what I know and I've heard so many people say it you don't know what it's like to be the president if you ain't never been the president you don't know it's easy to say what you would do but you don't know when you got people, when you got the Senate, the Congress, when you got people in high places that you don't even know about, that got money, power, and influence, and they come knocking at your door and they threatening you or they're bribing you or they or they they got some information on you, some stuff that you don't want nobody to know, and, they, and now they're blackmailing you. See, it's something else when you get to that kind of level because that is the kind of stuff that some of these people deal with. You got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might to trust that no matter what happens, God has you. So when you are in the land of promise, you got to be a watcher on the wall. What does that mean? So in Habakkuk 2, it says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. So when you are in this promised land, that is not the time to get off the wall. No, that is not the time to, to stop praying and fasting. No, that is not the time to stop seeking God for everything. No, that is the time to really be on the wall. You really need to be watching, especially when you are, um, the Lord has blessed you and called you to, to leadership and now you're leading a people. You have to know how to lead these people. You have to know, have the wisdom of God. You have to hear what God is saying on what to do, what decision to make, how to rule, how to govern. You have to be a watcher on the wall. And he, like he said, he said, I will watch and see what he will say to me. And see, when you're on that wall, you can't come down until you get your answer. You don't got time. You got to be like Nehemiah when Sam Bala and Tobiah, when he when they when he was on the wall, rebuilding the wall, fulfilling the assignment that he had was given. And they tried to do everything they could in their power to distract him and get him to come down. 
he had to look back at them and say, no, I'm not coming down. I'm not coming down for what y'all talking about. And he had to stay on that wall. We cannot come down just because you're now sitting on the throne of the in the promised land where God has called you to be. You can't come down just like as a wife. My God, come on now, women. We a lot of us love to do everything we got to do when we when we want the man to come find us. Right. We want to work out. We want to eat right. We want to get our keep our hair done. We wear our makeup. We smelling good. You know, we're doing all this right. We we kind, you know, we we have good conversation, you know, we 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 adorn them, you know, with all kind of, you know, uh, they they love to, you know, have that, um, you know, they love to be encouraged and they love to um hear, you know, those um oh my gosh, just a word I can't think of it. Oh my goodness, because we the, uh, my pastor and my pastor we talk about it all the time about how men they they love for you to just you know build them up with your speech and sweet words and to be kind to them you know and to just love on them and tell them how a great job that they're doing you know and just thanking them for all that they do right words of affirmation there it is thank you holy spirit they love words of affirmation and we'll do all those things right we'll do all everything we want to do and need to do while right? they're in pursuit but it seems like there's something that happens when you get into that place and they now you're their wife and now you don't feel like that you got to do the same things that you were doing before you got them because you don't recognize that what got them is what you were doing and you assume because they said i do that now when you let yourself go and you get overweight and you don't do your hair and you don't wear your makeup that they don't got eyeballs in some some way and somehow they're blind and so then when the woman is walking down the street and she fine and she got herself together and she got a nice body now you want to be offended and you feel away because his eyes is looking but baby if you gave him something to look at he wouldn't have to be looking at nobody else but that's what happens when we get into the promised land that's a practical you know i pray that's for somebody right that's a practical um you know analogy but that's true though and it applies to any area like it's one thing where you're going up for that promotion and you're working overtime you're going over and beyond you're the first one there the last one to leave you know you're doing everything you do your job in excellence you know you're doing all that you do you get the promotion and now you slack off and you come late you know absolutely what you took what you took to get the promise will have to you will have to do it to keep it and sometimes you got to ramp it up a little bit because certain promises, you got people coming for them, you know, like people don't want to see you happy, you know, you think, you know, everybody, you know, want to celebrate and is rejoicing with you, but they're not, so sometimes you got to even, you got to level up, you got to take your prayer life up, You sometimes you got to take your word life up, sometimes you got to be in the presence of the Lord even more, sometimes you got to go into the secret place even more, because not only do you might have the enemy, because the enemy's never going to roll over and just let you be in your promise and just let you have these things that sometimes you might have physical people that will try to come for it it's it's amazing to me where it seems like a person gets married and everybody under the sun all of a sudden like them and want to come into their dm it is so interesting and, and just like nobody wanted to go for this job or nobody wanted to take the position but all of a sudden you get it now everybody got something to say you know so because that's just how it is so when you are in your promised land you got to be a watcher on the wall because you need see because when you a watcher on the wall wisdom speaks at the entrance so god will warn you and give you a strategy before somebody try to come sabotage you before the enemy try to come with some type of warfare before something happens the lord will give you that revelation and he will give you the insight and in how to come against it so you're not even taken aback so by the time it comes you already you like i knew this was gonna happen and you're rooted and secure because you know that that you've already the lord have already taken care of it for you so that's why you got to make sure that you're a watcher on the wall as a queen as a wife as a businesswoman as a minister whatever it is that you are whatever your promised land looks like you got to be a watcher on the wall and you got to make sure that you do not come down for nothing yes things are going to come up life is going to happen all that stuff but you cannot come down from because you have been given an assignment there is a mandate like 
Nehemiah. He could not come down. He was given a mandate. It was a burden placed on him when he heard of the destruction of the wall and how it had laid in waste for oh, about a hundred years. And he was so overtaken with, with, with grief that he, he would, he got burdened to the point where he was like, you know what? If nobody else will do something about it, I'll do something. And he went and he sought the Lord before he even went to the king to get permission from this earthly earthly person that he would have had to go through. He went to God first. And he what did he do? He prayed a prayer of repentance. That's another thing about being a watcher, a watchman on the wall. Now I'm like trying to come I'm turning to the book of Nehemiah. Y'all might hear my pages, pages turning. That you got to know that when you are a watchman or when you're in your promise, that a lot of times you're the one standing in the gap for the nation, right? And God does not elevate people or give people abundance or access or, you know, give people positions and power for themselves. It's always for a people. So you got to understand now the burden of the people is on you. You got to stand in the gap for them. You got to pray for them. So when Nehemiah, he went to, to God first and he repented not just for himself but he repented for the for his father's house for his father's house too he repented on behalf of everybody because he understood that in order for me to go before the king i had to make sure that i have clean hands and a pure heart so i need to repent but i understand that see the sins of the fathers will go to the third and the fourth generations so let me make sure that i even repent on behalf of my family repent on behalf of my ancestors Oh, I got, I have a new phone and a new number. So I don't, my, I don't have WhatsApp again on there. Um, I got to um, upload it. So I'll have to get with you. I'll have to text you, um, Lily. But uh, thank you for joining. Um, and so he understood that you, he had to repent. He had to repent on, on behalf of him and his, the, his family's house so that his prayer would be heard so he could get God's attention. So is when you're a watchman on the wall, you will have to intercede for the people. You will have to stand in the gap for the people. I sure will. Um, you have to make sure that you are even making sure those people that you are over, you will have to sometimes even repent on their behalf, especially your family, because generational curses are real, because generational patterns are real. And so what happens is when nobody rises up like Nehemiah and say, I'll be the one to, to carry this burden on my shoulders. That's what the priest did before, before a G, the new covenant and before Christ and uh, was crucified and he rose on the third day the priests they the ones who stood in the gap they were the mediators they were the ones that carried the nation of israel on their shoulders they had the ephod and the ephod had the 12 stones on it on the shoulders that represented each tribe they carried the nation and they went and they interceded and they will atone for the people on behalf of god so they could cleanse the nation when you have been given authority when you have been given a, a influence when you have been promoted and you have now been given a people to be over it don't matter if it's just your children and your family it don't matter if it's maybe you're you're the boss on the job maybe you maybe you serve at church maybe you're the pastor whatever whoever the people is it doesn't matter you have to know how to go on behalf of the people and go before the lord especially as those of us who are called to leadership. It's never about us. I know we sometimes get it confused and we think it is, but it's never about us. It's always about a people. God is always, always, always in pursuit of the people. He wants none to perish and all comes to repentance. So that do mean even the people you don't like, God loves them and he wants them to be saved. Even the people who have hurt you, God loves them and he wants them to be saved. Even the people who have mistreated you, God loves them and he wants them to be saved. It's never about you. So yes, God will call you to be uncomfortable. Yes, God may put you into some spaces and places where you're like, Lord, what is this? Why am I here? What's going on? But it's all a part of you being in position to stand in the gap for those who cannot stand in the gap for themselves. That is what intercession is all about. It's about standing in the gaps, interceding uh, on behalf of someone who cannot intercede for themselves. And when you are called to leadership, you are supposed to be interceding for others than just yourself. 
now there may be seasons where that's hard like i'm in a season where that's hard for me i'm just gonna be honest like y'all know we keep it hot here on the podcast we're honest we're open and we're transparent and i'm in a season where it's real hard for me right now to truly consistently pray for others to intercede instead of the god for others i do pray for others but i feel like i pray more for my situation than i do for others and it's not because i'm just a selfish individual it's really because i have a hard situation that i'm a part of that that's going on in my life and it's very very difficult and it's very challenging and it hurts and it hurts so bad and i'm just like lord please 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 get me out please help me and my children help my family so i'm constantly going before the lord because i'm in pain i'm in anguish because i'm going through and so i but then even in that sometimes i feel bad and i'm like lord i i wish i wasn't in this situation because then i would i feel like i would have the release or the peace to stand in the gap and pray for others because i know Know the heart of God. The heart of God is for the the harvest. Amen. The heart of God is for the harvest. You guys, y'all might hear some noise or anything or some voices in the background um cuz you know, I'm not in the studio once again. Um that's just how where God has me right now. I got to do the best with what I have. And so um please 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 forgive me. Please disregard anything. Any cars you hear any noises any voices um just because it's just where i am um it's not anything i can do about it right now um so please um don't allow it to um distract you please but you know i feel like lord i should be praying more it's so much going on in the earth right there are so many things happening there are so many people who need prayer there is so much going on in the world right that i should be able to be on my face before the lord but i'm honest right now i can't when i'm on my face it's more or less for me and my circumstances for my children you know and i try to balance it out but sometimes it's hard and i think god understands and he knows but it can't be a consistent thing like you can't you shouldn't be going years and you shouldn't be really you shouldn't be going seasons where you're not praying for others right there should be a release a let up even if your situation don't change sometimes the lord is not physically changing your situation but well he'll give you more strength to endure right he'll give you more peace that surpasses all understanding sometimes you know he'll just lift that burden off of you and then you're able you're able to breathe and so you should be able to get to a place of intercession you should be able to get in a place of standing in the gap and praying for someone other than yourself even job after all he went through after and let me tell y'all this is nobody but the holy spirit because i don't even want to talk about the book of job okay I just was telling one of my friends the other day when I was picking her up from the airport, you know, about all that I was going through and how I was feeling. And we were talking about, you know, how she went through a very similar season where she was just, you know, in a lot of anguish and agony and frustration. Things were just, you know, so bad and it was just so difficult. And so then I said something to her like, um, Job, you know, the book of Job came up and I was like, I don't even want to hear about Job. I'm like, I don't even want to hear about Job. Y'all, excuse, that's my nephew. And I was like, I don't even want to hear about Job, right? Because I know a lot of times what believers do, and I, it's not a wrong thing, but sometimes it just doesn't help the person in the moment when you're going through a lot of suffering and a lot of affliction, right? When you're really in a place where, you know, the Lord has allowed so many things to come at you at once, and you are just really going through a time of trial and tribulation. A lot of people want to quote the book of Job. They want to, you know, act, tell you to read the book of Job. They want to, you know, mention the book of Job. And I was like, I don't want to hear about no Job, right? And she was like, I feel you. I know exactly what you mean. Because when I was in that season, you know, and I was reading the Bible with some ladies, we used to do like a, a Facebook Live Bible study. And we was reading through the Bible, the entire Bible. And when we got to the book of Job, she was like, and, you know, the ladies who was reading the book of Job, she said she was just in a boohoo, bent over, ugly cry just couldn't get herself together just the whole time she couldn't even do it she just cried 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 to the point where she didn't even no longer she didn't get back on the bible study she can no longer even just go through go through it because just get into that that book you know it triggered her so because of her personal circumstances but you know the bible is true right the bible is living it's breathing and you know the lord will give us certain things that we need in the moment even if we don't like it or we don't we don't want to receive it right and so the book of job it is a powerful book and it yes i would rather read it when i'm not feeling like job himself however you know 
Job, after all he went through, and even after being accused of having to done some type of sin or done something to bring all that all that on himself, you know, and his and his friends, you know, they're going through this big old debate. He the Bible still says after Job prayed for his friends. I find that very interesting. Let's go to it. Come on. Let's go to it. Job, let's go to Job 42. Because I find that interesting. Job was the one who went through all of that affliction. He went through all of that suffering, all of that loss, all of that grief, right? He is the one who went through it all. He's the one whose wife told him, sorry, y'all, that's the pages of my Bible. Uh, curse God and die. He's the one who lost all his children. He's the one who lost his servants. He's the one who lost his cattle, his wealth, his pro his possessions. He's the one that had boils all over his body. He's the one, right? And it says here in Job 42 and 7, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to e Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams. Okay, so I want to go, okay, to verse 10, right? Go to verse 10. It says, after Job had prayed for his friends, because the Lord ended up telling him, because we're going to read all of it. Forgive me. Sorry, Holy Spirit. Nope, I'm going to read it all. I'm going to start over at verse 7. It says, after the Lord had finished speaking, to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken truth about me. So there are some people who might have passed some type of judgment or have might tried to debate you and tell you why you're going through what you're going through, telling you why God has allowed this or why God has done this to you or what the root of this is or what the cause of that is. And they are accusing you of things that are not true. They're trying to force you to believe or say that you, you know, must have offended or did some kind of great sin against the Lord. Or there are some people that gave you some wrong revelation of who God is, who he is in his character and in his heart, right? And even those people, God will, he will be the one that will go and speak to them just like he did Job's friends, right? And it says, now take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. See, they had to now make atonement for themselves. They had to go make atonement because they sinned and them accusing Job of sinning, they sinned, right? And then it says, I, then my servant Job will pray for you. Come on, see that part right there. God is the one who is making things right on Job's behalf with his friends, setting the record straight. God will go to those people who have it missed, who, who are, you know, have things misunderstood. People who are accusing you, people who are assuming, people who are judging you, people who are criticizing you, people who are giving you false words or wrong revelation. You know, he will go and make those people, he will make it right with them. He will reveal to them the truth, just like he did for Job. Job probably had no idea that God was on working on his behalf, vindicating him to those people who were, you know, who were really speaking against him, that were speaking things that were untrue. Job probably did not know that was happening, just like for us. There are some people that have done me just dirtball bad wrong and i'm just like lord that's crazy because i don't know how that how they felt like that was okay i've ne never done nothing to these people but see it will be the lord that will be the one who will vindicate me to them it will be the lord who is going to be the one who will make things right and to clear my name just like he did for job and he's going to do the same for you let god clear your name you ain't got to argue with these people you a watcher on the wall because see if if Nehemiah would have succumbed to to the schemes and tactics of Tobiah and the, and Sanballat, see he would have found himself in an unnecessary debate. He would have found himself arguing, going back and forth, trying to you know prove a point to these men who who really is sent on assignment to be a distraction. And see that's why you gotta trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out to your own understanding. Because what you don't see as a distraction, or you might see as somebody who you gotta prove a point to, is the Lord sees that as a distraction. And if you seek the Lord, He will give you the wisdom like He did for nehemiah that you don't even come off the wall you don't even respond to that there are some of these these debates i don't know why i'm on this but there must be some conversations or some arguments or some debates that some of us have gotten into that we really should have ne we should not have responded it we should not have responded we knew it wasn't true it wasn't from god 
And for some reason, we felt the need to respond and we entered into these these heated debates and these arguments with people that did nothing but steal our time. And time we could have been seeking the Lord, time that we could have been building the wall, time that we could have been, you know, praising and worshiping, time we could have been, you know, just sitting at the feet of Jesus. We decided to go and respond to some of these unnecessary conversations to these people who who were not who were coming to be a distraction and take you off the wall, take you from building, take you from doing what God has called you to do. But even then, God, because Job went back and forth. He went back and forth with his friends. You know, he rebuttaled. You know, he continued to rebuttal and he continued to debate and he continued to maintain his integrity. And he told them, like, I'm going to hold on to my integrity until I die. So he did go back and forth with them. And so, but even still, God still said, I'm going to make your name right. I'm going to make things right for you. I'm going to clear your name with these, your, your friends, because they spoke falsely about me. They spoke falsely about God. God, right and so let God fight the battle for you let God vindicate you let him avenge you let him have to visit those people who are speaking falsely against, about him to you let him go and have and and cause them to come and they'll have to repent to you just like the Job's friends they had to offer sacrifices and stuff then they were told and then you're gonna go and my servant Job gonna pray for you so some of these people that came to get mighty God <laughs> hallelujah Holy Spirit some of these people who may have spoken false things, some of these people who you might ended up got into these heated debates with in these conversations you got, that were unfruitful and that just really wasted a lot of time and it ended up, you know, and people being offended and hurt and, you know, and all of these things. Some of these same people, though, are going to come back and repent to you, not because I said it. And not because of you, simply because of God, because they spoke falsely about God and they spoke falsely about what God was doing in your life. So it is going to be the Lord himself that is going to speak to these people, just like he speak, spoke to Eliphaz and he told them to go and get these sacrifices and offer them up and then go to my servant, Job, and he's going to pray for you. And when the Lord send these people to you, you are not to reject them. I'm going to say this we're, we're right now. Do not reject the people that come to you in repentance in the same way Joseph brothers, after all they did to him, they sold him in the savory lies that he was dead, set it up to where it looked like his coat was maimed with blood and had his father for all these years, just heartbroken and in grief because his favorite son, his beloved son of his, of his, uh, you know, uh, with his wife, you know, the, his beloved wife, you know, had died. And, you know, Joseph went into all this, uh, slavery. He went into the prison. He went into all this stuff, right? All these horrible things that he endured at the hands of his own brothers. And yet, and still, when he got in position, come on now, because here we go. See, this is all, it's all aligning. It's about you being in position. When you come in position, these same people are going to come and they're going to repent to you. They're going to come and they're going to need you to pray for them. They're going to come. They might need you to bless them and help them. Joseph had to bless and help his brothers, the same ones who hated him. The Bible was clear that his brothers hated him and they hated him all the more. The more he dreamed, the more favor he had, the more anointing he had, the more they hated him. So much so that that hate, hate because the Bible tells us that envy, envy is as wrath. And and um, I forgot, what, what does it say? Jealousy is as envy, envy and wrath is as murder. I'm sorry, I'm butchering that, but it's a proverb that talk about how wrath, you know, envy, how how it's just it's it's like a, a it's it's like a um a progression. You start with envy, jealousy, then envy, then next thing you know, you go to wrath, and next next thing you know, that wrath will turn into murder. And so for them, they didn't physically murder him, but they lied and, and they said he was dead, and they caused all of this grief for everybody in the family for Joseph, for the father, and whatever other family members. And then they had to live with this lie and keep this lie up all their life. And they had to do all this stuff. But yet and still, when they came before Joseph, as he was in position as second in command to Pharaoh, he could not judge them. He could not, you know, reject them and turn them away. He could not mistreat them. He had to still forgive them and bless them and help him. Now, yes, Joseph played a little game with him. You know, I don't suggest nobody do that. 
for whatever reason joseph he he played a little you know game with him but his heart truly was for for to be reunited and for to be reconciled because he loved his family and he and he really was there to to help and the love on his brothers even when they when they found out that it was him they assumed that that he was gonna take their heads off and he's like who am i, I am i god i'm not god i can't judge you what what you meant for evil god meant for good so make sure when these people come to you as a watcher on the wall as the one who has entered into the promise now you're in position now you're in command now you're second in command right now you elite now you in leadership you know now you're the, in the marriage now you're you know over the business now you're you know got the promotion whatever it is right now you got the property whatever it is when the people who came against you when the people who hurt you when the people mistreated who mistreated you come to you for prayer for help do not reject them do not do not do that is not god's heart god wished that none shall perish he, he said in ezekiel do you think i even want the wicked to perish no it is not so his wish is that all so uh come to repentance and none perish so you have to understand god still wants them saved too yes they hurt you yes it was wrong and god has his own way of dealing with people he has his own way of repaying people for the things that they've done and bringing judgment and consequences on people that is not for us to determine we cannot take judgment into our own hands we have to just be the vessels that god called us to be because it is the love of god that saves us we have done people wrong i know i have we have mistreated people we have hurt people so we can't get so high and mighty to where we feel like just because someone hurt us because it's always different when it's you it's always different when it's you but it's i feel it in my spirit i will say it again when you get into this place or you should be in this place or as you're entering into this place and these people who have spoke falsely spoke ill who have done you wrong mistreated you hurt you whatever they have done listen here you better ask god to give you the power the strength to forgive them and to release it right now to help you to let it go and when these people come to you for prayer or for help or whatever it is you cannot reject them because then you're gonna do with god because if god if, if they came back to you for prayer it's because god told them to just like he told eliophaz god told them to so let's go let's move on and it says i will surely it says then my servant joe will pray for you i will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves and that's why it's important for you to pray for these people because god's wrath probably is pending against them but again god don't necessarily want to always bring his wrath on people he's not looking out here to be looked at and known as this mean god right he wants people to know him as a god of love and mercy and compassion in the same way he has mercy and compassion on us he wants us to extend that to people so he said to them I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. For you have not spoken the truth about me as my soul servant Job has. Then Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namanite went and did as the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. This is why I pray for them with a sincere heart. Because God knows the difference. He, God knows the thoughts of man. He knows our heart. He knows the things that are in our heart. So it's important for you to truly have a pure heart and for you to do it with sincerity and don't do it grudgingly or just do it, you know, just to do it because you know that's what God is requiring. Do it and mean it because God will accept your prayer for them. You don't know whose prayers have been on behalf of you and why you are where you are you don't know who has been standing in the gap for you lifting you up you don't know that 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 person that you probably don't even think is praying for you who's been praying for you and god has heard their praise prayers and, and answered them so you want to be mindful of that right and then it says in verse 10 at well in my bible this chapter this part of the chapter is titled y'all forgive that uh loud whatever it is it says job's restoration and vindication see okay y'all a car about to drive down the street and it has a very very loud dual system or engine let's just let it pass okay it says job's restoration and vindication see what what is happening as we're entering into and as we have entered into 
our place of promise and our place of answered prayers, we're coming through restoration and vindication. So all the battles that you felt like you was weak and you felt like you was looking foolish and you let people, you know, excuse me, walk all over you or mistreat you because you didn't repay evil with evil because you turned the other cheek as the Bible tells us to do, right? Because you prayed for your enemies and because you prayed for those that despitefully used you and reviled you because you did not, you know, go and you didn't slander the person that slandered you. You didn't gossip about them. You didn't harm them in the ways they harmed you because you did what the Lord told you to do in righteousness according to the word of God. As we enter into, as we're crossing over, is coming through restoration and vindication. And it says, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his prosperity and doubled his previous possessions. As a watcher on the wall, your intercession is so important. Your prayers and your standing in the gap is so important. And even when you're not yet in the promise, but you're in the place where you are just going through the wilderness or, you know, (laughs) my God, mighty God, Holy Spirit. It is something about as we're coming out of the wilderness or coming out of, you know, the place of suffering and oppression. It is something about things getting intensified and things getting worse to give us the illusion that what God said isn't true or that we're not really coming out or that we're not really at the brink of crossing over right because the enemy wants to get us so distracted and caught up in in the pain and in the suffering and in the the intensifying of the uh, of the hardship and of of you know more more people coming against you or you know more bills is coming up or you ain't still don't got enough money or you know all whatever it is right you know your body is still responding to the report of the doctor when you believe God said you're healed right whatever it is it's it's like the enemy just like Pharaoh when Moses first went to Pharaoh and said you know my God said let my people go Pharaoh's response was first of all who's your God and second of all he like oh the people must got too much work time on their hands they ain't working hard enough so I'm going to increase the load decrease the work I'm increase the work and they're going to have to build these bricks without I'm without any hay I'm not going to provide the hay no more the straw I'm not going to provide the straw or the uh, mortar they got to go get it they sell and continue to produce the same quantity so the work got harder it got intensified and the people of god were so mad at moses like what have you done why did you come here talk about god your uh, our god said to let our people go look what you have done now our work we got more work on us they was ready to kill moses because they already was under pressure we know that because it tells us in exodus 3 as i spoke last um last episode their cry came up before the lord So they already were under pressure. They were already um, suffering. They were already under, had a a hard load on them. Already, they already had these hard taskmasters beating them down with this work, right? So now they think this deliverer, which he was the deliverer, came to rescue them, right? And next thing you know, things get worse. There is something about, but see, they didn't know in that moment that they were on their way out. That is what happens to a lot of us. And see, now I'm really speaking to myself because I've been really going through it. And I've been really having tension tantrums. I've been throwing a whole fit for real. Like, I've been ready to give up. I I said I was going to possibly delete the podcast, possibly delete my YouTube channel and just give give all this up, not do it no more. I'm, I just, I was, and I meant it in the moment because I was just under so much pressure. I was hurting. I was in agony. My heart was broken. It's anguish. It's pain. It's suffering. It's affliction. And, and, and it's just little, and then it's like more little things on little things on little things. Like this week, my son sprained his ankle r- bad. It's not a mild sprain. It's a moderate sprain. So I've been dealing with dad and trying to tend to him and then our circumstances i'm still trying to wait on the lord and figure out what we're going to do about our housing situation because we still need somewhere to live and what we're going to do about money because i still need finances i got the bill collectors emailing me and calling me and you know all of this and that and the third you know and i'm seeing other people get blessed with the very things that i want the things that i'm believing for i'm watching people that i know personally get those very things you know i'm dealing you know with just things within my body my body i'm tired more i can't pray like i 
I used to because I'm so exhausted and tired. I'm spiritually lethargic, you know. I, every time that I have build up my hope again that God is going to come through for me today. God is going to do it today. You know, baby, the miracle today. Then disappointment sets in because it doesn't happen. And then now my faith is low again or depleted. You know, I'm dealing with warfare and then my dreams and warfare at night. And then my, my dog started misbehaving more at night. My children, you know, doing little more things. You know, I got a little more on me because now I got to do a lot more than I normally do because my son whose um, ankle is sprained, he's my helper. He's the one who helps me a lot with his brother and around the house and he does a lot. And so now he's down. So I'm doing everything. You know, unfortunately, it's very hot where I live right now. And so it's just so many, you know, different elements that's contributing to my state of anguish and so i've been believing god i'm believing what the lord is saying i'm believing the word of the lord i'm believing the confirmations i'm believing what god has shown me and and and, it, and what god has spoken over my life but it seems like things have gotten harder it seems like things have gotten more intensified right and it's taken now for me to really be doing this podcast and, and all of these things that i'm speaking about i had no i had not set out I study none of these things prior to when I'm saying it. This is Holy Spirit. Because the only thing that I went to and the only scripture that I went to was Habakkuk 2. That was it because today's episode is Watchers on the Wall. And that talks about being a watchman on the wall. But the Lord is speaking because I know I may not be the only one who you re- you ready to give up and throw in the towel because that's what I'm re- was ready to do. I was ready to give up. I'm like, I'm tired of waiting on the Lord. I'm tired of going through this. I'm tired of doing warfare. You know, I'm tired of, you know, just, you know, just having this expectation and, you know, and just keep being disappointed i'm tired of seeing everybody else you know get blessed but me so you know i was to the breaking point where i wanted to give up and throw in the towel like i don't want to do this no more you know i can't take it you know my strength was low and so i really was going through it and, I, and it was this was real to me right i was serious like i was ready to give it all up like i don't even want to do this no more because it was that much um pressure on me the pressure was that intense right and now the lord is revealing that see the pressure that's a a tactic of the enemy that's by design that's why you got to pay attention to the timing of things it's so interesting that all of a sudden this last week and it kind of started last friday a week ago but like this whole last week things just kind of start being just little things been happening and things been coming up and situations been happening and this and this and that and it's like i didn't even put two and two together like oh this is just you know a a smoke and mirrors right this is just you know the enemy trying to blind me to what god is doing because see the israelites in that moment were blinded to the fact that they were indeed being delivered And now the deliverance did not come in the way that they probably anticipated, but they still were being delivered. And sometimes when we have expectation of how we're going to enter, come out of that place of oppression or that place of suffering, then we can miss it because we're looking for it one way. It's like, it's like the Jews, you know, they were, they're looking for the fulfillment of the Torah, the law, the Messiah that they are believing in to come another way. So Jesus has come. He has come and he has now ascended back to the right hand of the father and they've missed it. Some of them missed it because they're still waiting. They're still waiting on this Messiah that they have. They don't realize that he's already come, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is our risen savior, right? He's the fulfillment of the scriptures of the law and the Torah. You know, he is, he is the one, but because they are looking for it another way, they missed it. And some of us will miss it. The door may be open right before your eyes but because you're so focused on the intensity of the infliction the distractions what's going on the report the nonsense over here you know all of this stuff that you are not able to seek god like you need to because maybe the door is open already my god and so they were being delivered but even israel's deliverance came through restoration and vindication because they plundered Egypt. They bankrupt Egypt on their way out. See, because all that Egypt had were acquired was on the backs of the Hebrews. So technically it was theirs because you got to know they were not being paid for their labor. They were being sustained. They were given housing. They were given rations of food. You know, they were probably given clothing. Everything was coming through Pharaoh, but they did not have no ownership or access to anything for themselves because what they were being like, 
you know, in slavery times, you know, your quote unquote, your needs are being met the bare minimum, but in turn, you're working yourself to the bone and everything that is being built and everything that's being acquired is on your back, but you're not being compensated. So even God is seeing all the hard work you've done. God is seeing all the praying and fasting. God is seeing everything that you have done, everything that you have built and you have not been compensated for it. So God is going to restore you. He is going to make sure that you are increasing on your way out, that you are being vindicated on your way out in the same way he did for Job and the same way he did for Israel, because he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. He does not change. And so I just think that is so interesting, though, that even Job had to still pray for his friends before he was blessed. He was indeed blessed because then it goes into verse 12 and it says, so the Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first. And then it goes and talked about all the blessings that Job received, but Job received even more. Then he had, so whatever he lost, whatever that acquired, whatever he had acquired before and lost, he received even more or double than what he had before he went through his testing. So God is a God of recompense, a, rec a God of compensation and restitution. But even when you get into that place, even when you experience the vindication, the restoration, the blessing, the abundance, and now you're in your promised land, you have to still be a watcher on the wall because you now have to be in a position where you're able to see what is going on, where you're able to see and listen and hear what God is saying. What is he telling you to do? How is he telling you to govern? How is he telling you to rule? How is he telling you to be a wife? How is he telling you you know to be a minister to be a teacher a preacher how's he telling you to work in your business how's he telling you to be a parent like what is he telling you and then when you're over people when you're over your family you need to know what is God saying about your family what is he saying about your children what is he saying about your husband if you're over a people if you have employees or somebody under you or you're you know you in ministry and you have people you know who you minister to how does how does the Lord want you to minister to them what does he want to say you know what is what is he doing among them like you have to make sure you're watching on the wall and you have to learn how to intercede for others especially those that the lord has given you authority over you got to learn how to intercede to stand in the gap when you see a situation you shouldn't always have to address it or say something about it you should be able to go to the lord in prayer right if you're a watcher on the wall you should be able to see things before they come things nothing should catch you by surprise because you're on the wall, meaning you're up in the high place. The wall is higher than the city. So you're up on the wall and you're able to look over. You're able to look beyond. So now your your the your the vision your vision and the um and and what you're able to see now you can see more like your vision is now increased because you're higher up you can see more ahead of you like i have a truck and it sits up pretty high and because i sit up so high higher than most cars probably all cars and higher than some other suvs my my vision though like my sight i am able to see a lot further ahead so when if there's somebody who slowed down way down the down the road or way down the expressway i can see that because i'm up high so when you're on the wall and you're watching and you're seeking god and you're praying and you're you know interceding and you're staying in the face of god and you're seeking you the kingdom first and all his righteousness and you're interceding for people you're able to see things ahead you're able to see things before there come you able to see the opposition or you're able even maybe to see the obstacle because sometimes there's things in the road and if you're not listening to your gps i know my gps to say oh there's um some hazard in the road or there's uh, you know something in the road but if you're not listening to your gps you got to be able be able to you know be ready to maneuver around something that's made in the road that you didn't expect. So when you are on the wall, you're able to see things before they come. You're able to see the obstacle before it actually manifests. So now you are able to go to the Lord and get a strategy. You know how to maneuver. So these are the these are keys. So when you are in your place and in your, your position and in your promise and you're in the land of answer prayer, you got to be a watchman on the wall because you don't want to be a person that's always reactive. You want to be proactive. Amen. I, I don't want to sit under a reactive, you know, leadership. 
right? I don't want to have, I don't want to be married to a man who always reactive. The, the, the crisis always got to hit first before we try to figure it out. No, you anticipate, see what's coming, seek the Lord, get the wisdom, get to have discernment, understand, you know, pay attention. You need to be proactive so that maybe the, the crisis don't even have to hit us. And that's the importance of being a watcher on the wall. Some things can be deviated, right? Some things don't even have to come. They, they have to pass over. They won't even hit because you're able to see it. You anticipate it. You see, you know, you've already got the, the, the strategy. You already know what to do. And now what may hit and may be a crisis to everybody else won't be one to you because you're a watcher on the wall. Also, it, when the people come to you for forgiveness, the people who have hurt you, harmed you, disrespected you, done you wrong, lied on you, it don't matter. The Bible tells us that we got to forgive. We got to forgive. It does not matter. And is it easy? No. Do it seem fair? No. But it is a commandment. And by if we don't forgive, then we can't expect the Lord to forgive us because the Bible tells us that, right? If we don't show mercy, to by the same measure we show it to others, that's how God will show it to us. And I don't know about y'all, but I need a lot of mercy. So I got to make sure I show a lot of mercy. Amen. You got to pray for these people. Some of them know not what they do. Jesus prayed the people who were killing him, the people who were crucifying him, the people who were mocking him, have beat him, spit on him, that whooped him with a cat of nine tails and ripped his flesh apart. They nailed him alive to a cross. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him and everything you can think of. And he still prayed for them. He said, Father, have mercy on them for they know not what they do. I ain't never been put on a cross. Like, I ain't never been nailed to no cross. And I ain't never been whooped with no not cat of nine tails either. But, yes, we've been persecuted. Yes, we, you know, can be lied on. Yes, we can be mistreated. Yes, we can be hurt. Yes, we can, you know, go through some trauma, some trial, some abuse, some tribulation. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, if Christ could say, and yes, he was God, we can we can break that argument, but he was also 100% man. And if he could say to these people who were doing the worst of the worst, he was dying a sinner's death that he was he he was without sin. And he can say, Father, have mercy on them for they know not what they do. We have to be able to extend mercy to people, even if we believe they know what they were doing. We still got to show mercy. So you cannot reject these people. You cannot mishandle these people. They are God's people or, or God wants them to come to and come unto him. So you got to be able to show love and mercy and kindness. And you got to be able to pray for them, right? Because sometimes the blessing don't come until you pray for the ones who have come against you. Because see, Job wasn't restored until after he prayed for his friends, right? And then as you're on the wall and you're building, right? Don't let the distractions, don't let the Sam Ballas, the Tobias, the things that come up to try to get you off the wall, these time stillers, these distractions, this weight, the stuff that is not important, but that comes up and presents itself to be important because it's really just trying to steal your time and get you from doing what God has called you to do. Don't even respond when people are saying things that are not true, when people are trying to make you believe that the reason why you're going through something is because of something that is they don't even know what they're talking about you don't even have to come down and respond to them let god speak let god speak for you let god vindicate you let god you know let god clear your name right because again that's what the enemy wants the enemy wants to stop us if he can stop us he don't care that we get on the wall necessarily but if he can stop you from rebuilding if nehemiah would have stopped rebuilding or if he would have got down every time a distraction or something come up he would have never they would have never rebuilt the wall they rebuilt the wall in record time in 52 days the the wall laid destroyed for 100 years but in 52 days after they were mocked criticized you know all kind of stuff and and even their enemies were saying how oh they'll never be able to rebuild that wall they were able to do it because they had the right strategy they had the right strategy and they stuck to it and they had a, a focus and they did not allow anything to get them off of their focus. So we have to be like Nehemiah. Can't let nothing get off our, get us off our focus because things is going to come. He went through many different type of things. The enemy kept using 
these enemies and these Sam Ballas and Tobias in multiple ways. He even, you know, solicited a prophet and just all kind of things to just get Nehemiah to stop building. And Nehemiah did not fall for it. Now, why didn't he? Because he was a watcher on the wall. He had a relationship with God. He sought God. He understood the character of God. He knew the nature of God. So he knew even when this whole scheme was concocted with the prophet who was saying that, oh, the Lord said you need to come and you need to go to the temple. You need to come eat, whatever he said. Nehemiah knew that it wasn't true. And this is somebody who truly was a person, like a prophet. So even the enemy will use people, people of God, to try to be distractions in your life. You won't be able to recognize it if you are not a watcher on the wall, if you don't have a relationship with God, if you're not, if you don't have a prayer life, if you don't know the nature and character and heart of God, right? You're not going to be able to, 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 to recognize that this is really a trap. And so, you know, I just, I, I don't know, watchers on the wall. That's what I feel like the Lord is saying for today's episode of the podcast. I didn't get to do our um, welcome <laughs> because I just kind of got into it. The Lord began to move um, and so expressively. And so, yeah, um, I do want to welcome everyone to the Purity After Promiscuity podcast. I am your host, Janelle Renee, and here we are redefining a woman's worth. I want to welcome you to all my new listeners. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, come and just join us again. We are here every Friday um, for the most part around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We would love to have you come and be a part of our community. Um, the Lord is doing great and mighty things. He speaks expressively. You know, people are being blessed in many ways. Um, so um, just continue to, you know, to, to, come and and just allow the lord to speak to you right and to all my loyal listeners hey girl hey thank you for rocking and rolling with us it's our fifth season we out here in these streets you know minutes in the gospel right healing we're getting healed we becoming whole right we're being full of purpose we're being ignited so we can go out and we can flourish and we are able to function and rule and reign as queens in the promised land right so i'm just so excited for each and every one of you guys what god is doing in your life I pray that this podcast blessed you. I pray that you receive something from it. Please, please, please support the podcast by sharing, sharing with your community, share with your friends, your family, um, leave a review, um, comment, you know, let me know how it's blessing you. Also, you can connect with me. I am a coach. I am a purity and purpose coach. The Lord has done something new. And he said, no, ma'am, you are a purity and purpose coach. So what does that mean? Purity. Um, again, you know, this is purity after promiscuity and it's just uh, some women just really need um more um more guidance in how to live come from a lifestyle of promiscuity or a lifestyle of you know kind of you know fornicating and you know being involved in sexual sin to truly transitioning to a lifestyle of abstinence and purity because abstinence and purity are not the same thing um but you do need to be both and so the lord um has mandated me to help women to do that and so i can absolutely help you and also i am a purpose coach sometimes we need a little help in discovering what did god create us to do so i help with that as well and so so um, if you want to connect with me for coaching or just for prayer, I always leave my email, my contact in the description box. Feel free to um, reach out to me. I do respond and I would love to hear from you and pray with you and partner with you. So, um, yes, this is today's episode. Watchers on the wall. Thank you so much. I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you, that the Lord will make his. <laughs>